Lord together. Father, we come this morning, we just give you praise and honor and glory this morning, Father. We just, uh, we do ask, Father, that you be with this service today, Father, that you be with each and every person that's here today, Father. We ask that any kind of distraction, any kind of hindrance, anything that would stand in the way of you moving on each person in this place today be removed from here. We ask that your will be done today, Father. We ask that all things be done according to your will. Open us up to receive what you have for us. We ask a special blessing and on our services coming up this week, and we just ask that you continue to touch those that are sick today, Father. We ask that you help them all, help all of us. We thank you today in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Shadows around me, shadows. 
the world looks upon me as I struggle along. They say I have nothing, but they are so wrong. In my heart I'm rejoicing, how I wish they could see. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There's a roof up above me. I've a good place to sleep. There is food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Now I know I'm not wealthy, and these clothes there not new I don't have much money but Lord I have you and to me that's all that matters though the world cannot see thank you Lord for your blessings on There's a roof up above me. I've a good place to sleep. There is food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Think about this. There's a roof up above me. I've a good place to sleep. There is food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. free from the burden of sin there's power in the blood power in the blood would you or evil a victory win there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary time. There's wonderful power in the blood. Everybody, there is power, power, wonder-working power. In the blood of the Lamb, there is power, power, 
wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are left in their life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. you do serve us for jesus your king there's power in the blood power in the blood would you live daily his praises do sing there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb in the precious blood of the lamb Uh, turn back in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. We're going to be looking um, back at this. If I can get this thing to work, I, it may not work, but if it does, it does. If it don't, there we go. All right, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26 again this morning. And, and uh, I was sitting here and I was thinking and uh, actually uh, got a little tickled myself. Uh, and uh, the title of our message goes right, right along with what Rose was saying this morning. Uh, um, if you can see our little dog up there, um, the question of the, of, the, of the hour is, are you still sleeping? Um, really, it could be, are you asleep? You, you need to wake up. Uh, and um, I know that's difficult for some people sometimes, but um, a lot of what we need to be doing as Christians deals with the fact that um, we grow complacent, we grow sleepy, and we grow weary, and we grow tired, and we just, we just want to sit back on these nice, comfortable pews and take us a nap every once in a while. But we ain't got time to be taking naps. Uh, there is so much out there and so many people out there that needs uh, God's people to go out and share the gospel. Um, we see the evil in our world all around us. I mean, it's, 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 it, it, you just can't help but see it. I mean, it's everywhere. And the only effective um, way to combat evil is with good. And the only source of good is Jesus Christ. And the only, only way that people hear about Jesus is, is if the people who call themselves Christians go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. And so when, I think I talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, when we come in here, this is when we are to be prepared. This is when we're to be built up, when we're to be trained, so that when we go out there and we, and we take the gospel out, we'll be able to effectively uh, communicate and carry the gospel. You know, you don't, and I think I said it last week too, you don't have to have a degree to share the gospel with people. All you have to do is have Jesus to be able to share the gospel. And, and if you don't hear anything else I have to say this morning, hear this. Without Jesus, you're not going to make it. But with Jesus, you can do anything and everything that God calls you to do. But it takes Jesus to be able to do it. So, um, but like I said, though, we're going to be talking about Matthew 26. We've been talking about Matthew 26. This is a big, long, huge chapter. And this morning, we're going to cover verses 31 through 46. And we're going to cover just a couple of different things. There's a couple of um, interesting things that are going on here in this passage that kind of play in with one another. And if you remember uh, last week, uh, we talked about two different plots there were to kill Jesus. One by the, the high priest and his people, and the other one um, was carried out by Judas himself. You remember Judas? 
Judas uh, had, had, been, had actually sold, basically sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And, and um, we ended uh, last week with uh, what, what we call the Last Supper with, um, with the disciples gathered around and Jesus sharing the bad news that he's about to be betrayed. And he's also, he, um, he confronts Judas with this fact that he is the betrayer. He is the one that's going to carry all this out. And we also looked at how the disciples didn't get it. And, and for the life of me, you know, reading my Bible, I don't understand how they did not get it except the fact that they didn't want to understand it. Because in their mind, they're talking about Judas just wanting to quit, go home, give up. And that was the form of betrayal that we really talked about in relation to, to church people who betray Jesus. And, and if you don't think you can not betray Jesus, just, um, just, um, just, wait, just wait, wait a little while. We'll see. Um, because I think a lot of times uh, we get a little bit puffed up and think that, oh, I'll never do those things. And we're going to find out with Peter that, yeah, we can do those things. Um, and we, we talked about that. And we talked about all these things that went on. And, and so we, we go from there, and we're going to pick up just right after that. And, and we're going to look at what Jesus does with uh, actually three of his disciples, uh, Peter and, and, um, and, the, and the, brother, the sons of Zebedee. Um, I'm getting my tongue tied here a little bit. But... Um, but we're going to be looking at that and we're going to be looking at Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, these are just hours before his arrest. And the whole thing is really summed up in verses 45 and 46. And I'm going to read those um, two verses um, to you this morning. So it says here in Matthew chapter 26, 45, Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. He says the hour is near. Do we realize that? Do we realize that the hour is near? For all of us, for this whole place, the hour is near. He says the Son of Man is betrayed and he's in, into the hands of sinners. He says, rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Father, we come again, and I do thank you for our time so far today. I thank you for blessing us. I thank you for being with us. I thank you for helping us in all things in our life. I ask you, Father, to be with us. Help us to understand your word. Help us to use your word. Help us to apply your word. Help us to take your word and share it with others that are so desperate for hope. Help us to share that hope that's found only in Jesus Christ. We thank you for this in his name this morning. Amen. Amen. All right. Let me get a drink of water. So have you not figured it out by the picture and everything so far? The theme is about the disciples falling asleep when they should be watching and waiting and and they need and they need to be um, on the lookout. Not and, and we say, well, they're looking out for the people that are coming to rest. No, Jesus wants them to be watching and waiting and standing, kind of in solidarity with Him and supporting Him. That's what He's looking for them to do. But they can't even do that. The simplest thing, they can't even do that. But I want to back up. I want to back up and look at what leads us to that place. In verse 31 of that chapter, it says this, Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away. Now, notice he didn't say one or two of you. He said, you will all fall away on account of me. And he quotes here, Zechariah 13, 7. He says, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So things are, are they're getting real for them is the best way to put it. And Jesus is trying his best to prepare them. And they've got in their mind that everything's going to be fine and everything's going to go on and, and they're going to be these perfect disciples that are, that are just going to be whoever Jesus calls them to be. And they're all, oh, they got it together. And Jesus says, no, listen. He says, this very night, every single one of you is going to fall away. You're going to run away. You're going to be afraid. And you're going to, and you're going to run. You're going to, think about it. Fall away. We know falling away means falling away from God. He says, every one of you. There's not a single one of you that's going to be excluded from that. And he says, it's going to be just like Zechariah talked about. He says, I will strike the shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd. He's going to be struck and beaten and killed. He says, and the sheep will be scattered, running from the wolves. 
And this is where it comes in. We say, well, I'd never do that. I would never react that way. I would never fall away from God. I would never fall away from Jesus. No, not me. We better be really, really, really careful when we say things like that. Because those things tend to puff us up. And that's where Satan comes around in the back door like the wolf and devours us. Because I will tell you this, we do not know how we would react in any situation if we have never been in that situation. We want to look at people and say, oh, look what they did. I'd never do something like that. Have you ever been in a situation like they've been in? Have you ever been faced with the decisions that they've had to face? You don't know what you would do because you've not been there. None of us do. None of us do. So we have to be aware of how much faith we really have, how much, how, how, how much gumption we really have, how, how, what, how strong is our ability to follow God. So when we start to get puffed up, we're going to get knocked down. So Jesus tells them, all of you are going to fall away. But he gives them some hope because he says, but after I have risen, there's the hope, after I have risen, after I have defeated death, hell, and the grave, he says... You're going to come back because he says, I will go ahead of you in the Galilee. I'm going to go there. I'm going to be waiting for you because I know you're coming back. So that's a, that's a little glimmer of hope. Whether they believe it or not, that's a different sermon for a different day. But Peter, oh, good old Peter. We love Peter because he acts so much like every one of us. <laughs> he gets caught in this, I will never trap. And it says, Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Not me, Lord. No, 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 no. Well, Jesus pops his bubble a little bit and says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. He said, Peter, you know, you think you got it together. He says, before the rooster crows three times, and we know the rooster crows around sunlight, sun, day, day up, whatever you want to call it. He says, before he crows three times, you have already disowned me three times. You have already disowned me. You have already abandoned me. You have already fallen away and given up. And that's before the night's even over. And you're going to say, I will never fall away? How many times have we been guilty of that? So I would never do that. And the next minute, boom, we do it. Mm-hmm. Kind of makes you think about it a little bit, don't we? But here's Peter. Here's his response. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. You know, he's puffed up. He looks like a rooster all puffed up, strutting around. A mix between a rooster and George Jefferson, I guess. He said, not me. And then all the other disciples, they get in line with Peter. Oh, yeah, well, Peter's going to say, we can't. Oh. They says, and all the other disciples said the same. And I can just, uh, I mean, this is just me imagining. And I just imagine Jesus just kind of shaking his head. Thinking they're never going to get it. They're never going to get it. But there's other things that he has to do. There's other things that have to take place. So, he knows that he's going to have to have some level of endurance if he's going to make it through himself. If he's going to be able to make it through this, honestly, he's going to need some help. So what's he do? He goes and prays. He goes and prays. And it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And then he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He was so sorrowful, so troubled. It says he was at the point of death. And the only way I can imagine it is he was at the closest point to a complete breakdown without actually having one. Because it was... So, think about it. If you knew your, how, when you were going to die, how you were going to die, and there was nothing that could change it, how would, you, how would you react? 
And Jesus said, he said, what? He said, I've got to go pray. And he says, stay here and keep watch with me. Be here with me. Be here with me. And there's two things with that. Number one, if Jesus thinks that he needs to go to pray, have me, do, do we not need to go and pray? Do, should prayer not be our first thing that we do? When we get bad news, what's the first thing we should do? We should be praying. But what do we do? We leave that off to the very last thing a lot of times. We'll say, well, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to consult this. And then when nothing else works, then we'll go pray. No, go and pray. Listen to God's direction and follow God's direction. Man, it may not change the outcome of anything, but at least you know you have God's support and God's with you and God's right there going with, through it with you. So pray. Don't ever quit praying. Don't ever quit praying. I would ask, but I don't want people to lie. I was going to ask how often do we pray. Once, twice, three times a day, four times a day, I don't know. But none of us want to, do, want to admit that we don't pray as much as we need to. None of us want to admit that. But I'm just as guilty as everybody else. I don't pray as much as I need to. Because I'm bullheaded. I'm stubborn. I say, oh, I can figure this out. Yep. And when I do, I say, oh. Whew. And then, when we can't do nothing else, Lean flat on her back in a hospital bed. What do we do? Well, I guess I better pray a little while. See if God can take care of this. Because I sure didn't do a good job of it. So, that's the first thing. The second thing, look what Jesus does. He tells his disciples, keep watch with me. Be there with me. Support me. Help me. Pray with me. See, God doesn't want, and God is always with us, but God does not want us to go through things by ourselves. That's why God surrounds us with other people so that we could stand together and pray together and watch with one another and be there with one another. But do we do that? How often do we do that? How often do we see a brother or sister struggling and we stand with them? And pray with them. And be there for them. Ah, oh, we're too wrapped up in our own thing. We got our own stuff going on. Now we do like the disciples do. It says here, going a little farther, he fell down on his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He says, Lord, he said, Father, if there's any other way, Let's do it. He says, but it's not my will. It's your will that has to be done. It says, then he returned to his disciples. What did he do? Found them sleeping. Sleeping. And he says, could you not keep watch for me for one hour? And look who he asked. Peter. Peter. Mr. Peter, the one who said, I will never abandon you. I'm your top disciple. I got it all together. I got it all worked out. And Jesus said, Peter, you couldn't even stay faithful and watch and pray with me for one hour. You were so tired that you had to go to sleep. You grew so complacent that when I wander by, I just find you sleeping. What's going to happen when Jesus comes by? Is he going to, what's he going to find us? Is he going to find us asleep? Now, these are nice, comfortable pews. And we can come sit on them every single Sunday. But guess what? There are six other days of the week, too. And if you think that Jesus is going to come back on a Sunday morning when, when you're at your absolute best, chances are that ain't going to happen. We better be watching and ready all the time. And if we see other people around us that we, that we know that we can help, 
We better be trying to help them as well because that's what it's all about. We don't know when, we don't know how, but we know that he's coming back and we know that if people aren't ready, they're going to die and they're going to hell. How many people in our family are not ready? How many of our friends are not ready? How many people in our church are not ready? I'll say it. How many people sitting here right now, this morning, are not ready? Think about it. Think about it. And there's no shame in not being ready. The shame is if you don't do anything about it. Because guess what? There's been a point that none of us were ready. Raise your hand if you came into this life and, and, and you knew Jesus from day one and, and you had never seen it. That's what I thought. There was a point that we were all not ready and we all had to be ready. We had to give ourselves to God. We had to give ourselves to Jesus. All of us. But the devil's like, oh, people, don't go up there. People won't go pray. Oh, people will do this. Just, just, just tell the devil to shut up. And don't listen to him because he's lying to you. If you are not ready to meet Jesus, you had better get ready because he's coming. And if you leave this world, and it don't matter how old you are, how young you are, because if you leave this world and you're not ready, if you know better, it's eternity and hell separated from God. That's not pleasant, but that's the truth. But he says, could you not watch with me for one hour? Could you not be faithful for one single solitary hour? Just one hour. But he doesn't leave it with that. He gives them another chance. And he says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. But then he says something. He says, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And see, Jesus recognizes something. Jesus recognizes his, his disciples are in an unsanctified state. That they're not ready because, because well, I mean, for them, the Spirit hasn't come yet the way we know the Holy Spirit. Guess what? The Holy Spirit's been here since Acts chapter 2. That's been a long time ago. And there is no excuse for us not to be ready, not to give ourselves to the Spirit. Because here's the thing. This is what Paul says. Paul says, I, I try to do good, but evil follows me everywhere. That's my, you know, my translation of that. He says, you know, I want to do good, but my flesh tells me I can't. He says, and he also says that there is a war going on between the flesh and the Spirit. And with these disciples, the flesh is winning because they, ha they have not given themselves to the Holy Spirit. And if you're struggling with the flesh with it, with you wanting to do good but can't do good, it's because you have not given yourself to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not in control of your life. And until the Holy Spirit is in control of your life, you will always live a defeated life. You will not have victory. You will always be frustrated. You will always be on the brink of quitting and going home. You will always be on the brink of, of betraying Jesus. Because the Spirit is what enables us. The Spirit is who empowers us. The Spirit is who gives us the ability to make it through these things that we have to go through. Life is hard. Life is hard. I didn't know that when I was young. But the older I get, the more I see it. It's hard. And the only way we make it is with the Holy Spirit. The only way. Now we may muddle along and do okay this time and not so good that time. And will things always go our way? No, absolutely not. They will always go God's way, whether we like it or not. The only way we make it is with the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The body is weak. <clears throat> so he went a second time, and he prayed. And he tells him, My father, if it is now, <clears throat> now possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. You know, Jesus is... You know, I think it's the Gospel of Luke. It talks about him um, praying so hard, um, drops of blood sweat, drops of blood. Jesus is physically exhausted just from praying. I couldn't imagine. When I, I've never been physically exhausted from praying. Never. 
I will be the first to admit that I've been praying and fell asleep. But I've never been physically exhausted from praying. I mean, Jesus was physically exhausted. And he just wanted his disciples to be with him, to help him, to stand with him. And it says when he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. Their eyes were heavy. And he says, so he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. And he was, and this is just me imagining, he was probably hurt, disappointed. And I say that because I think God is also hurt and disappointed by our own complacency, our own unwillingness to watch and pray, our own unwillingness to get out and help other people. Our own unwillingness just to worship Him. I mean, I'll just be honest. Now, I'm not just picking on our church. I'm a lot of churches. We, we have nice churches. Now, you know, our building's a little bit old. You know, the church down the road may look nicer, may be prettier, may be fancy. But compared to other places in the world, this is like the Taj Mahal. We got air conditioning. Sometimes it's too cold. Sometimes it's too hot. But we've got air conditioning. We got padded seats. We got carpet. We got cameras everywhere. We got lights, computers, all that stuff. People are worshiping God out under trees. That's what they call their church. In buildings that are put together with garbage. That's what they call their church. You think they care about their buildings? You think they care about what their, the person next to them is, is, does or says? No, they're there to worship God. And when we come in here, we should be ready to worship God. I know it will never happen, but I would love to see everybody in here back tonight. I would love to see you bring two or three people with you. And I'm going to tell you, if you come back tonight, come back ready to worship God. It's called revival services for a reason. Sometimes we need to be revived. We need to be woke up as we fell asleep. We need to wake up and see everything that's going on around us. Everything that's going on. And just because we come and gather in a church building doesn't mean we're insulated from it. But I'm going to just tell you, the same sin that's out there can wake its way in here. We just have to be aware. We have to watch and pray and stand with each other. It says, then he returned to his disciples. Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Here comes my betrayer. Stand with me if you don't care. Y'all care to come. <clears throat> you know, here's the thing. Jesus was ready to do what he had to do. Jesus' disciples were not ready. But you know what? It was going to happen regardless of whether they're ready or not. We are going to stand before God one day, whether we're ready or not. The question is, are we ready? Have we been watching or have we been asleep over here on the sidelines somewhere? Are we ready? I don't know, maybe you need to come this morning. Maybe you need to receive Jesus Christ this morning. Are you willing to come and do that today? Maybe you need to come and you need to submit yourself to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit be in control of your life. Give yourself fully to God. Give yourself fully to the Spirit. Are you willing to do it? Maybe you need to come and get woke up. You've fallen asleep. Come and let God shake you awake. Or oh, maybe you have somebody on your heart that you need to come and you need to pray for. You need to stand in for them. 
come and do that today too. But you've got to be willing to do it. You've got to be willing to come down here and do it. Because I can't do it for you. You have to be willing to do it. The question is, are you willing? Are you willing to come and lay everything on this altar and give yourself to God? That's what it's all about. So it's entirely up to you this morning. You all go ahead. All right, let's all pray. Father God, we do come this morning. We do thank you for being with us and just helping us today and every day, Father. And you know the many, many names, Father, that were called out in this place this morning. I just ask you to touch and be with each and every one of them, each and every one of their families, Father. Just help them, touch them, heal them, Father. Give them strength. Just guide them as they go about. Just remind them, Father, of the hope that's found only in you. Go with us today as we leave this place and bring us back. We thank you this morning in Jesus' precious name. Amen.